You know, I happen to be blessed to come from a family of voracious readers. My mother has a uh, master's degree in English and introduced us to poetry and to literature at a very young age. Now, my father was a physician, but he was a, <laughs> a regular fan of Louis L'Amour and a lot of other books like that, and always had a book that he had going on at all times. And we were taught to read at a very young age and to continue to read, which I've continued through my life. You know, that's important. You no doubt have heard of trying to keep your brain active or keep your brain functioning through reading and crossword puzzles and what have you. And those are great practices and and should be continued. But they're more temporary. When actually working on the brain, reading crossword puzzles, these kind of mind games, brain teasers, have a temporary effect on the brain. But if you want to really maintain fantastic short-term memory for phone numbers and dates and, and names, or even more importantly, keep those processes of the brain acting at full capacity. Well, that takes developing an athletic brain today on the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast. Welcome to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Health, wellness, exercise, nutrition, and a whole lot more. Got questions? Call us and leave a message at 251-278-EDGE or message us at Personal Edge Fitness on Facebook and Instagram at Team PE on Twitter or PersonalEdgeFitness.com. Hey, good day and welcome to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast. My name is Garrett Williamson. I'm president of Personal Edge Fitness. Thank you so much for joining me today for this podcast on the brain and basically developing what I call an athletic brain and how that actually will give you a brain for life. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Having those processes that you had when you were quote unquote young and maintaining them throughout your life and staving off things like Alzheimer's, like dementia. Before we get into it, I want to tell you how to get in touch with the show, especially if you have any questions about this podcast or any others, or as always, some of our greatest ideas come from the fans of the podcast and just asking questions that deal with dispelling the myths of health, fitness, and wellness. And actually, that's what we're working on today. I am dispelling a myth, though I'm not against the typical practices of this. I am dispelling a myth. If you're interested in contacting the show, get in touch with us at area code 251-278-3343. That's 251-278-EDGE. You can also reach us at my email address, which is Garrett, like my wife loves to say, just like Levi Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, at personalizedfitness.com. You can also reach me at our website, which is personalizedfitness.com. Personalized Fitness is our Facebook page. Hit me up on X at Team PE if you are so inclined. This is a topic I actually have discussed a little bit about this before, but it comes up a lot with 35% of our clientele over the age of 65. And just in the population and the people I run into in the public, having trouble with their brain, having big fear of Alzheimer's, or having problems with short-term memory, this topic rears its ugly head all the time. And actually, there's a very easy fix to it. There's a way to address it. The popular way of reading and doing crossword puzzles in order to stimulate the brain has been the accepted norm. And it's even recommended by many, many health professionals. Again, I'm not against that. That's why I started off the podcast talking about the fact that I do come from a long line of readers, usually have a book going at any point in time. There's several of my family members that digest books, a lot more books than I do. Don't do a whole lot of crossword puzzles, but that's a fantastic exercise also. But those don't do anything, anything compared to what exercise does for you and developing what I call an athletic brain. I'm going to get into that and get into the comparison about that, but I want to first address something that a lot of people think about as a problem for most everybody. It's a problem that we don't have to have, and that is short-term memory problems. One of the things I hear all the time, and I have to tell you, it's almost like when I hear somebody say it, it's like fingernails across the chalkboard to me, and that is that I'm not good with names. I'm not good with names. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret, and you may be insulted by this. I hope you're not. It's meant to be informative, not to insult, but if you understand why that happens, Because it didn't just happen like I was born good with names and I'm born bad with names. That's absurd. That's not in the genes. Why I don't want you to be insulted is the reason that we have that problem is we don't actively listen. We don't actively try to remember a name. And no matter what you say, oh, I try, I promise you, I'm going to show you the steps to why that occurs and I can show you how to correct it. And it's very simple about how to correct it. It deals with encoding and turning a thought into memory and also the storage, transferring those thoughts to long-term memory. So what happens as far as uh, when you hear a thought, when you hear a name or something, what happens in your brain? Well, it's basically three different steps. The attention and sensory input. This is when you actually either see an image or you hear a sensory, the visual sensory, 
or Audible Hit Century, you hear a name or you see a picture, you see a name or something, and you want to remember it. That goes into a what I call a temporary part of your brain. It goes into the uh, occipital lobe. That's for anything visual. And then also the temporal lobe, which is for auditory information. If you're interested, occipital loads towards the back of the brain, temporal loads on the sides of the brain. And so that's when that first enters. doesn't stay there. It just, that's where we perceive it. So I understood that combination of numbers together is a phone number. And, uh, and that's where I understand that, by seeing that or hearing it. In the short-term memory, where the thought goes from there, it goes into the prefrontal cortex. And that's the area of the brain that holds it temporarily. It's why you hear a name and you know you heard that name. You know you heard it clearly, but all of a sudden, just a few minutes later, you can't remember it. Well, it only stays in that part of the brain for a very brief amount of time. I mean, maybe a minute that it stays in there. Then what we have to do is we have to actively, actively put that in a different part of our brain. And when it makes it to that second part of the brain, that's where it becomes a memory. Now, when we hear a name, we're constantly thinking about the next thing we're going to say. We're going to ask you, how was your weekend? Or, or let me introduce you to Bob. Let's go to my next thought. We're thinking of our next thought. Therefore, we're not thinking about that name, the name that somebody told us. My name's Bob Nelson. Boom, I'm not thinking about it, Bob Nelson, because I'm trying to introduce you to my wife, Stephanie. Instead of taking the second to remember that name, by taking that extra second to repeat the name or introduce that name to somebody else, you know, Bob Nelson, I'd like to meet, meet my wife, Stephanie. Stephanie, this is Bob Nelson. By doing that, it goes from the prefrontal cortex to the hippocampus. And that we go from now from attention and sensory input, entering those different lobes, the temporal or occipital lobe, and then going into the short-term memory, which is prefrontal cortex. And then by the next step is what we usually miss, which is attention and encoding. And that is basically thinking about that name for a minute. And you can do that by using the name again or using the phone number again, repeating that. And if you do that, then that goes to encoding, that goes to the hippocampus. And that starts the transfer into what they call consolidation and a long-term memory, or basically transferring that thought into long-term memory. So I just wanted to address that really quick because that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what I'll talk about today. But just by doing those things, repeating a name, repeating a phone number, repeating something you saw or what have you, or writing it down, anything that you're taking a minute to think about whatever that is you're trying to remember, we'll transfer it to that hippocampus and start making it into that encoding process and making it into a long-term memory. Back to developing that brain and maintaining what I refer to, this is my made-up term, and that is an athletic brain. I'm hit with this a lot. I had clients for years that were proud of the fact that they were walking around with crossword books all the time, walking around reading a book all the time. They were telling me, you know, I'm doing this for my brain. I'm doing this for my brain. I'm doing this for my brain. That's great. That's, don't get me wrong. Please don't stop. That's fantastic. I want to keep bookstores open as long as I possibly can. So please, please continue to do so. But that's not as effective, nowhere near as effective as exercise. Now, I don't tell you these things without having some kind of research and backing it up. Let's talk about a few of these, though. Let's, let's look at some of the different mechanisms that deal with how fitness enhances cognitive function. Let's start off with a study by the University of Illinois and was on uh, aerobic exercise and hippocampal volume. Okay, hippo, hi, hippocampal volume, hippocampus. That's the part of the brain. We want that handling memories. We want things transferring into that area. Exercise stimulates the production of brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's abbreviated BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, a protein that supports the growth of neurons and synapses. And this process known as neurogenesis is crucial for learning and memory. And this study actually demonstrated that aerobic exercise increases hippocampal volume, the area of the brain associated with memory and learning. So we get that from exercise. We don't get that from reading. We don't get that from crossword puzzles. We don't get that from brain teasers. We get that from exercise. Number two, improved cerebral blood flow. Okay, I talk about blood flow a lot. And if you think about it, you know, I I thought about how can I use this example? How can I describe that? And I was going to be redundant. You know, blood flow is the lifeblood of our body, (laughs) of course. Well, I'm going to use it the other way. We use lifeblood a lot. Democracy is the lifeblood of our constitutional republic. Okay, why do we use that? Why do we use that? It's the lifeblood of this. You know, water is the lifeblood of, of nutrition. You know, whatever is the lifeblood. Uh, our, our culture here is the lifeblood of personal edge. Why do we use that example? Well, lifeblood is everything in your body. If, if, if you stop the blood flowing, that's it. Everything ends. 
yeah, well, you die. <laughs> but I mean, every organ shuts down, every function shuts down. Blood flow is incredibly important. Well, if we can improve cerebral blood flow, blood flow to the brain, we're, you know, it's pretty obvious. I don't, I'm going to point out a study here. But if I told you right now, if I shut off blood to your brain, will it stop functioning? Yes. If I decrease blood flow to your brain, yes, it, of course it's going to hurt everything. Well, regular physical activity enhances cardiovascular health. Duh. Of course, if we get that heart rate going up through anaerobic or aerobic exercise, then of course we're going to stimulate blood flow. We do that on a regular basis. Our body's going to get used to it. Therefore, it's going to adapt. Your cardiovascular fitness is going to get better, not just in your arm, not just in your legs. And a lot of people think of the chest area because my heart is getting better. Well, if your heart is getting better, then blood flow to the brain is getting better. And so enhanced blood circulation ensures a steady supply of oxygen and nutrients, promoting optimal brain function. Think about this. You've heard about this either on uh, a TV show or possibly sadly in your life coming across somebody that we perform CPR on them, but, you know, their brain has not had oxygen for a certain amount of time. When that happens, the, the, Im you have immediate damage. And it's a very short amount of time. I'm sorry, I don't have that amount of time. So you know how important oxygen is to the brain. Well, if we can increase oxygen to the brain, we can increase brain function. So research published in the Journal of Neurology found that individuals who engaged in high levels of physical activity and better blood flow and higher brain volume compared to their less active peers. So by increasing better blood flow, they had higher brain volume compared to their less active peers. Pretty simple. And again, you're not going to get that through reading or doing crossword puzzles. By the way, I keep beating that up. I'm going to tell you some benefits to the reading and, and doing crossword brain teasers, these kind of things. I'm going to tell you that in just a second. I'll tell you exactly what that does because it is good. It is good, definitely. Number three of the different mechanisms through which fitness enhances cognitive function. The reduction of inflammation and oxidative stress. Now, we hear about that a lot, reducing inflammation, foods that reduce inflammation. You know, water actually can help induce, reduce inflammation. Exercise can help reduce inflammation. Inflammation is a bad thing. We want to have a more of an anti-inflammatory effect, especially when it comes to brain because it does cause oxidative stress, damage to that organ, damage to that system. Chronic inflammation and oxidative stress are linked to neurodegenerative Degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. And when you say Alzheimer's, might as well throw in dementia there. Because if it causes Alzheimer's, it's going to cause dementia, cause dementia, it's going to cause Alzheimer's. Exercise has been shown to reduce markers of inflammation and oxidative stress, thereby protecting brain cells from damage. This study done by the University of California at San Francisco, it indicated that older adults who exercise regularly had lower levels of inflammatory markers and better cognitive function. Simple. I mean... A plus B equals C on this one. Exercise, getting more oxygen to the brain equals you're going to have better brain function. And number four of those mechanisms is enhanced neuroplasticity. And I like this because I have a great comparison for this one. So neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to adapt and reorganize itself. That's neuroplasticity. So if you think of plasticity, neuroplasticity, you think of that word plasticity, it sounds a lot like flexibility. And that's basically what it means. The more flexible you are, just forget about the body. The more flexible you are in your lifestyle, you're more adaptive. The more flexible you are in your work schedule, you can take on different projects, you can change gears, you're more flexible, you can do a lot more. Well, this is what we're talking about with the brain with neuroplasticity. Exercise to boost neuroplasticity by increasing the connectivity between neurons, which enhances learning and cognitive resilience. And now this research in the Journal of Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience highlighted that physical active adult, older adults exhibited greater neuroplasticity and cognitive flexibility than sedentary individuals. Don't you love that? Even in the quote that I'm reading from the study, they use the word flexibility. So I'm going to repeat that. Highly physically active older adults exhibited greater neuroplasticity and cognitive flexibility than sedentary individuals. I'm going to do a little comparison contrast here. Again, Big fan of reading, big fan of the crossword puzzles, obviously a great fan of exercise. But comparing physical fitness with what they call cognitive activities. Cognitive activities are, like I say, crossword puzzles, jumbles, brain teasers, reading. While reading and solving crossword puzzles do the other cognitive benefits, their impact on the brain health may not be as comprehensive or potent as that of physical exercise. Now, I'm going to list three different comparisons here. And the first, I think, is most important, the scope of benefits as far as what exercise can do for you and for your brain versus what just cognitive exercises can do, cognitive activities. The scope of benefits. Cognitive activities like reading and puzzles primarily stimulate specific brain regions related to language, memory, and problem solving. In contrast, physical exercise benefits multiple brain regions, including those involved in motor function, coordination, 
and executive control. Okay, so the cognitive activities do stimulate language, memory, problem solving. Hey, that's what I want my brain to do. Well, actually, back up. Another problem that we have that we typically see in our senior population, strictly not because time passing on a calendar that has no bearing on anything. Anybody that tells you that is an idiot because it's not true. But mainly those things happen because we stop using those parts of the brain, using that parts of the body. But the other things that go along with it, I'm sorry, this is what I started to say, is where balance is controlled. Balance is not in the body. The vast majority of the control of balance happens to be in the brain. It happens to be in the cerebellum more specifically. So when they talk about the fact that the physical exercise benefits multiple brain regions, including those involved in motor function, coordination, executive control. One of the biggest things you're talking about there is a balance. You're talking about agility. You're talking about dexterity, which we seem to quote unquote lose because time passes on the calendar. It has nothing to do with time passing on the calendar. It has to do with the fact that we stop stimulating these parts of our brain. You get that from exercise. You don't get that from cognitive activities. Number two, long-term cognitive protection. That sounds pretty important. Protecting the brain long-term. A study published in the Journal of Psychological Medicine found that physical activity was associated with a lower risk of cognitive decline in older adults. Think about it. Think about your friends that are, let's say they've reached that senior status or somewhere in there, but they've been exercising a long time. Across the board, with very few exceptions, and I can actually talk about what the exceptions are, very few exceptions, they usually have fantastic cognitive function. There was a gentleman down our street that I hate to say that my father used to actually make fun of because he quote-unquote ran, but he got into basically a running stance, but it was more or less a walk when he was going out and doing his three, four, five miles. I'm not sure how far he ran, but we, I used to see him, we used to see him driving to school every single day, and he was out running. He lived just down the street from us, but I was a young guy and uh, somebody I didn't regularly converse with. Well, my folks had a party one night, and this man who's well up in age, who I'd seen doing this for years, and my father would joke about, oh my gosh, that's not even running, he's not even doing anything. And my father was practicing medicine at the time, and he was reading, and he was, he was don't get me wrong, he was pretty well close to the top of his game. This gentleman happened to be an attorney, and he came to this party, and I opened the door, and I could not believe how sharp he was. His memory, remember my name, talking about things I'd done as a kid, and just quick, not missing a beat, not stuttering his words, you know, just fast. And I'll never forget that. It, it, it kind of burned in my brain. It made it into a hippocampus. I'll never forget it. But he had been exercising all this time, and so he had maintained his cognitive function. The third comparison is mental health and mood. This is what's kind of interesting. Exercise has well-documented benefits for mental health, including reduced symptoms of depression and anxiety. One of the biggest reasons for that is the fact that your body releases, when you exercise, releases a fantastic drug. It's called endorphins. And uh, it's a type of morphine that we can't replicate. And that's why you get into that runner's high you've heard about. And actually, if you be honest with yourself, when you've been through an exercise bout, though you may be tired afterwards, you actually feel better. You're in a better mood. Well, why? Because your brain has been basically being <laughs> injected endorphins and it's hitting effects in your brain. These improvements in mental health can have a positive feedback effect on cognitive function as a healthier move enhances motivation and engagement in various activities. If you're depressed, you don't want to do anything. If you're feeling good, hey, let's get up. Let's do something. Let's, let's, I don't care if we're sitting in the chair. We're going to talk. We're going to converse. We're going to do something. You feel better, so therefore you feel like doing something. And so by doing those things, you're going to stimulate the brain even more. In contrast, while engaging in puzzles can be mentally stimulating, again, fantastic, it does not significantly impact mood or mental health to the same extent. So the way I look at it in comparison, again, Please keep reading. Please keep doing the puzzles. And contact me and share your brain teachers with me. I, I think that's a great idea. It's fantastic. I'd love to know what those are. But they're, they're temporary. In fact, I compare them to flexibility. I have people that talk about doing uh, stretch classes. And we actually have a dynamic stretching class that we, that we offer. And they're trying to improve the flexibility. Fantastic. Great. I'm a big fan of flexibility. I was a gymnast for years. I taught gymnastics for 20 years. Big into flexibility. But stretching is temporary. Strength training, strength training is long-lasting for flexibility. The stronger the muscle is, the more flexible it's going to be. So you may stretch it that day, and you feel more flexible that day. But that's going, the benefits of that stretching session are going to go away. The benefits of the strength training condition for flexibility is going to stay with you. And that's the same thing we're saying here. Those temporary effects of reading, of doing those cognitive activities, is going to be temporary. But exercise Exercise is going to keep that brain function 
for good. And the other thing I always say about that, 30% of the water is used by your brain. Therefore, hydrating your brain, I'm telling you, that ridiculous, quote unquote, senior moment I'm having, I can't remember my neighbor's name, even though he's lived next door to me for 40 years, that is lack of water causing that. So <laughs> we're going back to one of my favorites, and that is maintaining mm, hydration. Stay keeping that brain hydrated. I promise you that will help you with those quote unquote senior moments. If you have any questions dealing with this, and it's something I like to talk about a lot, but if you have any questions about this, please reach out to me at area code 251 278 3343. That's 251 278 EDGE. You can also reach me at Garrett, G A R R E T T, at personaledgefitness.com. Personaledgefitness.com is our website. Personalized Fitness, our Facebook page. Hit me up on X at Team PE if you so desire. If you want to have that brain that maintains its quote unquote youth, that is thinking fast, that is operating fast, it's one of the reasons why I talk so fast, <laughs> then you need an athletic brain, and we can help you get there. It's one more way. We help you reach your level of wellness. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Subscribe now and be a part of the show by calling 251-278-EDGE or message us on Facebook and Instagram at Personal Edge Fitness or at Team PE on Twitter and visit us at personaledgefitness.com.